you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric, with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of the 13 vampiric clans in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the clan of the beast, Clan Gangrel. You're late. (sighs) It's no problem, for the night is still young and we have plenty of time to discuss matters of all things vampiric. It is typical that the one time you're not so punctual is when I wanted to introduce you to someone. I had invited a fellow Canite scholar, a Cuthbert Beckett, to my haven, to refresh my memory on some of the finer details of his clan, Clan Gangrel. He is an oddity within the clan, as he is quite the gentleman, such as myself. (laughs) The Gangrel aren't really known for this. Most are proud masters of the wild, accepting the beasts as a part of themselves. To think of them as humble tribesmen is most unwise, as they don't take too kindly for the arrogance of civilization. They live for the bloody hunt and brutal interventions, trading war stories with others of their ilk. What makes the outcasts more deadly than most is their unique discipline, protean, which allows them to straddle the line between shape-shifting and vampirism. With it, they can embed themselves with the earth, turn into predators like wolves, falcons, bats, and any other creature they can muster, and turn into an almost invulnerable mist. Animalism draws them that bit closer to being one with the beast, whilst fortitude allows them to take a bit of a beating. In short, they are not to be taken lightly. You might be thinking that the gangrel share similar traits to that of the werewolves, the lupines. You would be right in thinking this, but that does not make them allies. All kindred have some malevolent taint, called the worm, that all lupines are destined to destroy. Some campfire stories romanticize the idea of kindred outsmarting lupine and possibly befriending packs. But let me just tell you now, this is a stupid idea. Encounter a werewolf, you run. Don't even fight it. Don't even think about fighting it. Don't even think, Neonate. Just fucking run. Potential bloody demise aside, you may be considering the reasons why these two share such similar properties. There are some theories to this, of course, but few of the Gangrel are concerned with the facts. Their history is passed on by more oral tradition, so many of the details have been lost to time. Anoria is the commonly accepted name for the Gangrel antediluvian, and was most certainly female, according to Beckett and so many other scholars at least. Although, he didn't need to tell me that, for I already knew that Anoria means the female half of God, who is said to be a child of Lilith. Anoria was abandoned by Lilith and lived with a pack of wolves that raised her, allegedly having a child with them. This is the origin story of how the werewolves came to be, which says a lot about the werewolves if they encouraged the idea of bestiality. Presuming that she was immortal, she left the wolves and travelled to the second city, where she was embraced by either Enoch, Lilith, or Drachian, the Ravnos antediluvian, becoming the Gangrel antediluvian in the process, technically making her a Methuselah rather than an antediluvian proper. There is also a far less common story that depicts Anoria as a male by the name of Enkidu, who got himself into a rivalry with Ishtar, a name given to the Toreador antediluvian. This is mostly false, as Enkidu was one of Anoria's childer. It is worth mentioning anyway, as you may have heard of this story in the future and come back to question the authenticity of my knowledge, which is most unwise, Neonate. Understand? Good. The subsequent child of Anoria would travel the world, shunning many of the civilizations of antiquity, roaming the woods and preying on the tribal societies who regarded them as evil spirits that were meant to appease. They almost had nothing to do with the development of the Roman Empire, though occasionally a Britannical Gothic gangrel would nose around Rome in the hopes of catching a young neonate off guard. That said, they had some influence on the cultures of the ancient knights of Greece in the Byzantine era in particular, whose people were obsessed with wilderness, hunting, and farming. They would scatter and flock to Morocco and North Africa, fighting the conflicts between the Spanish Hashburgs and the Ottoman Empire, staying and fighting the Stethites with Hippocha and her brood, the disciples of Anubis, or fleeing to the sea. 
It might be this that encouraged the development of the clan variant, the Gangrel Marina, who takes the forms of sharks and whales rather than wolves and bears and such. It is said that the marinas count only about 30 among their number. Those numbers are to be underestimated, as marinas tend to consider themselves individuals rather than a distinct bloodline. Many ancient Gangrel were among the Golden Horde of the Khans, obliterating Asia and Russia who was led by Dobrol the Brave, founder of the Anda bloodline, often referred to as the Mongols. They also had a mission in destroying the Tremere across Europe, who began sampling Gangrel, Nosferatu and Semiti blood to create the gargoyles and to destroy the Venture who turned a blind eye to their experiments. Although it was a Nosferatu that discovered what was going on concerning the Tremere, it was the Gangrel who brought it to the attention of the other clans. The other clans were too busy helping the Tremere destroy the Salubri or just trying to turn a blind eye on all of these things. Eventually, the Samitsi would join the Omen War to wipe out many Tremere chantries scattered across Europe. Then there is the bitter hatred between the Gangrel and Ravenos that still exists to this day. The earliest fights were over territory initiated by the Gangrel. They fought over the Middle East and India, which resulted in the Gangrel moving to Scandinavia. Said Gangrel took up the job title of Viking, who are often single-minded and incredibly fanatic. They have to be strong of mind, body and soul if they wanted to survive Nordic Scandinavia, showing disdain towards modern technology and weapons. Yes, they still exist to this day. The Gangrel were very much an independent clan, and in many ways they still are, and yet they attended to the Convention of Forms and joined the Camarilla. Why is that? They didn't trust most of the clans, especially the Venture and the Tremere. The Gangrel were the best equipped for avoiding the Inquisition. If they didn't adopt the mystical form, they soared to the skies as birds or sunk into the depths of the earth. And even if a hunter knew why an individual had fur and glowing red eyes, they were still no match for the claws and fangs. They didn't join the Ivory Tower to be bosom buddies with the other clans or because they were in as much danger from vampire hunters like the other clans were. The relationship between Gangrel, Elder and Child was not so manipulative as the other clans, so they did not invest in the angst that caused the Anarch Revolt. It was only natural for the Gangrel to assign themselves to the Camarilla, for they did not approve of the Diablery encouraged by the Anarchs. The Gangrel, for the most part, never really approved of the great kindred taboo. The Gangrel Elders and anyone else with half a brain cell also knew that the clans would be stronger if they allied with the others. The likes of the Salubri are an example of what stubborn solitude can do to a species. There was also the issue regarding the Tremere making gargoyles out of Nosferatu, Gangrel and Zemitsi that needed to be solved. The rivalry ended with the formation of the Montemarte Pact. The Tremere would no longer create gargoyles with the Gargoyle Creation Ritual, a level 5 formaturgy ritual, in addition to releasing any held captive. In more recent years, many members of the outcasts have defected to the Anarch movement. A vocal portion remained independent, pursuing a path of enlightenment, rather than adopting the path of humanitas. Some would join the Sabbat, with two strains of anti-tribute would form. They are the Country Gangrel and the City Gangrel. The Country Gangrel are largely similar to the main clan, with fortitude, animalism and protein disciplines. How they differ from their Camarilla brethren is that they are savage, vicious hunters, more comfortable in the wilds between cities than the concrete jungles themselves. Their role within the Sabbat takes the form of assassinations and scouts, using their command of animals to gather intelligence on the comings and goings of other kindred. The City Gangrel, as the name would imply, have adapted to city life, foregoing animalism and fortitude for celerity and obfuscate. They remind many, myself included, of coyotes which is why they have that nickname. They are creatures well suited for wilderness life, but they adapt to an urban existence quite smoothly. With the vast amount of prey in the cities, paired with the Gangrel's inherent mutability of blood, the bloodline to flourish. Their association with the Sabbat means that they embrace constantly, but also that their unlife expectancy is short. To outward appearance, the Gangrel seem human, dressed as appropriate to the area and the social class that they mimic. But don't forget the city Gangrel are still Sabbat vampires, and that means they are predators. Any disguise they adopt is strictly camouflaging to allow them to get close enough to bite. On the topic of Gangrel Vitae, the clan is particularly prone to numerous offshoots, variants and bloodlines, so much so that it is hard to know where to draw the line between what constitutes a proper Gangrel and what does not. Individual opinion among clan members differs naturally. Fortunately, I am not a Gangrel, and thus entitled to talk about them as either a clan or a bloodline. 
Such discussions regarding the Ander, Noriads and Aramanes and other now mythical bloodlines will have to wait though, as there is more about the clan proper that must be discussed before we move on to these mongrels. With the development of technology and the grandiose infrastructure that would dominate our modern cities, the Gangrel had to adapt or face extinction, a lesson they learnt during the Victorian period. It was during the rule of Queen Victoria that the city and country Gangrel began to develop as their parent bloodline, the Greek Gangrel began to die out. Beckett insists that he was the only Gangrel to have regular dealings with proper kindred society during this period, as most of the clan members hiked into the wilderness to wait out this new burst of human ingenuity and religious seal. <laughs> Can you smell that, Neonate? It is that rapturous smell of bullshit. Beckett is not so special and not so unique in that regard. Many Gangrel embraced the new wave of technological improvements, enhancing how the clan would hunt and stalk their prey, in addition to protecting their havens as they began to form their own pacts, which aren't to be confused with Sabat pacts. That being said, they would much rather take wing rather than rely on computer emailing. After all, computers can be hacked, as any Nosferatu can tell you. The predatory instincts have translated to a lot more than guns, swords and spears. A lot of Gangrel have become more comfortable in boardrooms. Surprised much? Trust me, the offices in Wall Street are just as cutthroat and bloody as a street filled with hoodlums. Despite their advances and changes in appreciation to adapt to using technology, a lot of their ancient traditions remain, for better or for worse. Their approach to embracing child often chooses their candidate during feeding. If the mortal prey resists fighting against what is happening, then his reward after death may be a taste of Gangrel blood. It is a tradition that dates back to Anoria herself. The sire will then abandon their child to fend for themselves, occasionally checking in on them from the shadows. Weakness is something the beast cannot abide for, so the child that has their wits about are the ones who quickly work out that they are big very vampires. Remember how I said that Beckett was an oddity within his clan? Well, he is not as odd as I made him appear to be. The clan are all loners, terrific lore masters and virtuoso storytellers, similar to how you may have sat round a campfire and you and your friends told ghost stories and the big monsters that lurked in the shadows, each one enticing you to hear more. Only, the monsters in these stories are very real and are usually each other. These take place in special meetings called All Things, where the strong speak and the weak listen to the tales that celebrate the strong and mourn those that shouldn't be forgotten. And for a clan that is forever on the move, they must have hundreds of stories to tell, for they are a clan that constantly evolves, one that has created more bloodlines and offshoots than any other clan, like the wolves and dogs they take the form of. Their bloodlines are like... Mm, dynamite. They are like dynamite. Short fuses that don't last very long but go off with a bang never to be seen again. They are hunters and predators and are a clan to be feared and approached with caution, as they have a good relationship with their beast, with many elders no longer resembling their past mortal selves. And should you step into their territory without permission, their claws will begin a wonderful relationship with your face. In short, tread lightly, Neonate, when you go wander around the woods tonight. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.